Okay, good. All right, so Boober. Um, good. So today, um, I think we will go a little bit faster than other classes because I've put the two lectures in one. <laughs> so, um, and I'm, I'm going to start with uh, the second reading and then we'll go back to the first reading uh, because it will complement the second reading. So, uh, so those of you who read, right, you, you are seeing there that uh, Buber here is, is dealing directly with romantic relationships, right? And he's dealing with an issue during his time where people were at a crossroads, right? He, in the 30s, when he's writing, this is the beginning of the sexual revolution in Europe. Here it came a little later, right, in the 60s, but the equivalent of the 60s were already taking place in the 30s in, in Europe. So there is a sexual revolution taking place. There is um, a criticism of old, you know, archaic institutions, especially the institution of marriage is, is heavily criticized at the time in general, right, by the public. Uh, it's seen as, as an institution which is not only uh, doesn't work because love is not fostered within this institution. So number one, there is the notion that it doesn't work, but also there's a notion now with the uh, women's rights movement that it's, uh, marriage has been a source of oppression for women. Right, so so marriage in a way has become, in the eyes of many in the 30s, a, a completely uh, outdated, oppressive institution that we must simply get rid of, and and women in a way are part; they are in a way at the forefront of this revolution. Right, they don't want to be held in the shackles of marriage and of these rigid roles that they have to uh, uh, take on. Right. Uh, and, and of course, uh, they want freedom, right? They want to be able to be both a woman and a spouse, right? Not just one. <laughs> so, so there is a whole movement of emancipation away from marriage into uh, um, uh, an approach to love, which is much more free, right? Unshackled, where one kind of, um, you know, uh, follows the course of one's heart, of one's existence. One is not shackled to a person, to an institution. And so women were really at the, uh, they were leading this revolution. Men, of course, were also quite relieved <laughs> right, by this uh, um, attack on marriage, right? Because in a way they too were stifled by that institution. And so there's really this opening up now of, of the sexual relationship to include other ways, right? There is not just the committed one person for life relationship, but people are exploring alternatives. They're exploring, uh, and we are now actually at the same crossroads, honestly. They're exploring having uh, several partners at the same time, open relationships, polyamory. This was all taking place already in the 30s. And it was a, an, an experience, a social experiment, right? To see whether love would be better uh, held or better nurtured or better with mm, cultivated within these uh, freer relationships, right? So that's where we are socially speaking and so forth. If you want to read a great text, which I'll also recommend when we do a regrade, but I'm already going to put in the chat. This is Anais Nin. Um, any work by her, she's um, she was one. Um, she's She's very well known in France. She, she's known for two things. She's known for her erotica writings, which I don't think are that great, but what I really like about her, her stuff is her journals. And if you read her journals throughout different uh, epochs, you will see the, the, the unraveling of this sexual revolution and how many women were at the forefront of this, right? She was um, unmarried, right? She was really single all her life, but she, her journals are full of her different relationships, what she learned and so forth. So it's it's really an, an illustration of what was this alternative like, right? So uh, so anyway, so Boober is now entering the scene, this scene, right? And um, he's now going to study both. He's going to reflect on both roads right and and we we need to remember that we are at this crossroads now most of you are at this crossroads you will deal with partners who will ask you let's get married or who will ask you let's keep it open <laughs> right you will once in your life fall on one of these people <laughs> right so we are really at a crossroads where we have to decide whether we will go for committed relationship one partner for life, or whether we will experiment with the different forms of love that we are experimenting with right now as a society, polyamory, open relationships. And all of you will have at one point a partner who will 
want to go in one or the other direction. So how do we respond? You need to take a stand right now and decide, okay, what is going to be my path, right? And so Buber is actually going to offer a very interesting reflection on both. He's going to actually criticize both, <laughs> right? He's going to show both the good uh, of these two paths, and he's going to show the potential pitfalls of these paths, right? So it's very good as you enter your love journey and you begin to choose a path over the other, it's good to know what are going to be the pitfalls and what are going to be the advantages, right? So, so that's where we are, right? So he's going to look at, at marriage and then he's going to look at this more um, open uh, relationship type love. And he's going to bring uh, an interesting reflection on both. And then he's going to what he's what he's going to do then is attempt to redeem marriage, right? He's going to look at ways that we can, uh, in a way, inject some of the spirit of some of the freedom of the open relationships of the polyamory into the marriage. So he's kind of doing a synthesis. It's, it's very interesting. Now you might be wondering, what do you mean? <laughs> How does one do a synthesis of open relationship with closed relationship, right? But you will see, it's actually quite brilliant. He's able to kind of inject some of the, the free spiritedness of the polyamory culture into the marriage institution. It actually comes out uh, very interesting. Uh, so, so that's how he's gonna, that's where he's headed, right? He's gonna proceed to, uh, and by the way, by marriage, you know, it don't have to be, you know, most of us, I mean, most of us, <laughs> some of us are not going to be married in a church, right, or in a synagogue. Marriage, by marriage, he means a long time uh, partner, one partner, right, not many. So you can see if you want to understand marriage in that way as a committed relationship with one partner that you might be in right now, right, that's, that's, that, that's, that's what he means by marriage. Okay, so are we ready to go and look at these two paths? Wave at me if you're with me. Okay, good. Once in a while, I check your faces. Um, to see that you're still there. Um, okay, good. All right, so let's go first. He's going to look at, uh, first of all, marriage. I'm on page 94. Second paragraph, that institutions. Wave at me when you got it. 94, second paragraph, that institutions yield no public life. When you have it, wave at me. <laughs> I don't see any waves. One wave, I need two waves. Second wave, please, somebody. Where's my second wave? <laughs> okay, thank you, Mark. All right, great. All right, so, so reading page 94, second paragraph, he's criticizing marriage and he says this, that institutions yield no public life. So he's talking about the institution of marriage and he's saying it yields no life, <laughs> right? Is felt by more and more human beings to their sorrow. This is the source and the distress and search of our age, right? And this is, I think, this is a very powerful statement which applies to us, right? We are in a time where marriage has is 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 really not working right and this is the source of distress and search of our age we are searching for love right most of us will struggle to find it this is really the distress of our age and most of us if we find it will struggle to maintain it right so there is an issue there is a crisis of marriage if you look at the number of divorces at the number of remarriages most of us are from broken families right um or rearranged families, I prefer that, <laughs> rearranged families. So, right, but there is really a struggle, right, uh, in not only finding a partner, but also keeping that partner, right? So, so we are really, what Boomer is talking about is, is exactly where we are, right? So then he continues, that feelings yield no personal life has been recognized by a few so far. Uh, actually, let me, let me skip. Uh, third paragraph, those who suffer, are you there? Wave at me. Those who suffer, okay. So then continuing to criticize marriage, right? Those who suffer because institutions yield no public life have thought of a remedy, okay? So those of us who are criticizing the institution of marriage, and we'll see why in a second, he's gonna give details as to why marriage is problematic. Um, but in general, right, marriage has been, I'll just give you a broad lines, right? Marriage is problematic because it's uh, in a way artificial. Right, you're stuck there and you have to manufacture love you don't feel, <laughs> right? And very often it just becomes a business arrangement between two people, right? People stay together, not because they love each other, but because the kids, the house, the mortgage, the vacations, you know, so um, uh, the husband's or the wife's paycheck, right? So, so, so it's not working, it's not authentic, right? 
So hence the backlash, right? So those who suffer have thought of a remedy. Feelings are to loosen up or thaw or explode the institutions. So now there is an idea, well, let's go explore, let's follow our hearts. Let's not follow duty, <laughs> or like Kant, like the old man Kant has tried to teach us. Let's follow our hearts, right? Let's go. If my heart says stay, I stay. If my heart says it's time to move on, well, we have to learn. And there's a whole, by the way, um, there's a whole culture of this, right? Learning to let go, learning that some people are just for a season, right? Learning to move on to the next phase. So we are really taught, right, to navigate in this way that, you know, it's time we should just follow our feelings. If I don't feel good in this relationship, well, it's simply an indication it's time for me to move on. If you don't feel good, who am I to keep you, <laughs> right, from moving on? And we, we feel bad even forcing people to stay with us, right? So, so we are really in that place, uh, a lot of us, where you know we want to be authentic to our feelings. We want to follow our hearts. And, and Buber is acknowledging, right? This is a legitimate uh, quest. Right, so he says, um, so we will explode the institutions with more, uh, a, a better attunement to our hearts, to our feelings. And then he begins the criticism as if they could be renewed by feelings by introducing the freedom of feelings. So now he's already starting to criticize and we'll see why in a second. So then he continues, when the automatized state yokes together totally uncongenial citizens without creating or promoting any fellowship, he's talking about marriage, right? Um, it is supposed to be replaced by a loving community, right? So think uh, commune, right? Those hippie communities that were here, there was the equivalent in Europe, right? You would live with several partners in a, you know, in a loft <laughs> with a group of people and you would switch, <laughs> right? So this was a thing, uh, still is in some parts, of course, of, of, of our culture. Um, and then he continues and he says, uh, and this loving community is supposed to come into being when people come together, prompted by free, exuberant feeling and want to live together. So he's saying here, these people are, are moved by their hearts, their feelings, they feel it, they stay, they don't feel it, they go. And that's a natural way, more spontaneous, more authentic, more genuine way to love, according to that community. But then he says this, but that is not how things are, right? True community does not come into being because people have feelings for each other only right only because people have feelings for each other okay so so he's showing right so we'll go now deeper into the criticism right and then we'll go into the remedy but um in general right basically what he's saying is that marriage is has failed but so has uh polyamory right anyway now we're going to see why right he's just stating now we want to analyze the, the structure of these two relationships and for this he's going to use these concepts that i introduced in the um, uh, in the recorded lecture, right, which is, I'll put it in the chat, the I, you, the I, it, right, the I, I, and the I, you, right, these are three concepts that he uses, that he's going to use in order to analyze, to, to reflect on the structure of these relationships, to see what is possible pitfall, what is a possible problem here that we can encounter as we enter these relationships. So let's go here, let's begin with the critique of marriage. Okay, I'm on page 92. I'm just gonna read the last paragraph. Tell me when you're there. So standing under, just wave, uh, wave at me if you're there, standing under and I need more faces. Um, Novo Suleimanov, Pierre, Souvenance, Celia. I need your faces, thank you. Okay, uh, great. So let me read. Um, from the last, last paragraph of 92. Standing under the basic word of separation, which keeps apart I and it, he has divided his life with his fellow men into two neatly defined districts. Now, here we go. These are the two paths. Institutions, feelings. Okay, we just talked about that. So marriage, institution, open relationship based on feelings. And then he qualifies it. It district, I district. Okay, so now we already know what he's already giving a diagnosis. The marriage will suffer from I from 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 degenerating into an I it, and the polyamory will eventually, according to him, or ha has the danger of, of de uh, degenerating into the I I relationship. Okay, so let's look first at marriage, where he's defining how marriage can quickly fall into an I it relationship. So can anyone remind me what is the I-it relationship? 
Can anyone define what that relationship looks like? And we've done Kant, so we have the tools to define it now because it's exact, almost the same thing. So let me see a virtual hand defining for me the I, it, Rudolf, go ahead. Thanks, so <laughs> his first path is person to person or the I to you. And the second is the person to object to the thing, I to it. Um, whereas the I to you is reciprocal and communicative and the I to it is a relationship that is can be based on a number of things. I'm not quite sure if I detected what he means, but it is the instant enjoyment, the instant gratification of something that does not require any kind of communication between myself and another person. Okay, good, good. Very, very, very nice explanation, right? I, it, think of the it. It is simply to see the other person as an object. This is an it, this pencil is an it. This book, well, this book is ambiguous. It's a little bit of you, it's a little bit of it, right? It's, it's a human object, right? But the pencil is an object. My bottle is an it, right? Your phone is an it. Some of you see it as an I, <laughs> but it's an it. Right. So what he's saying is that marriage can quickly degenerate into a relationship where the other person is an object for us. Right. Now, we studied this with Kant. Right. Remember, Kant said that human beings cannot be relegated to the territory of objects. What is an object? An object is something that I can use and discard. Right. Make sure you write this down. That's the definition of an object that we already know from Kant. Right. Kant already uh, gave us this clarity, right, about what an object is, right? Object, let me say it again, is something that I can use. And when I'm done using it, I discard it, right? So I it relationship, <laughs> basically, you're in it. In a way, the marriage ends up being a, a relationship where I'm just there because you are beneficial to me, <laughs> right? And then when I'm sick of you, I will just divorce you <laughs> right? and discard you, right? So so the marriage, but in general, right, the focus of Buber here is that the, the marriage becomes, your beloved slowly becomes, you, you continue to stay with them, not because you love them, but because somehow they're still beneficial to you in some way. That's the only reason you stay in the marriage. There is no love left, right? And so quickly, uh, and then we'll talk about it, right? When we talk about the you, how very quickly we turn our beloveds into its. Right. But in general, right, we turn them into an object that I can control, that I can manipulate, that I can use, that is just there to please me. <laughs> right. And I know, you know, marriages where the partners are treating each other like that. Right. So that's his his main critique. Right. That the marriage will eventually degenerate or is in danger of degenerating. That doesn't mean it will necessarily, but many marriages are in danger of degenerating into an I8 relationship. And at that moment, of course, we learned this from, who did we learn this from? Uh, I forget which author, but at that moment when they become an I, it, this is when the feelings begin to die, right? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how, when feelings die and why and how to prevent it. This is very crucial information. I hope you're listening for today because today is really going to save your marriage <laughs> right? in the future. So, so let me say it again, right? And I, it is when the person becomes an it, an object that I can control, use, manipulate, uh, and so forth. And as I sink into these behaviors, right, of controlling, using, manipulating, uh, the, the, the feelings begin to die, right? And then we are in a farce, right? This is a pretense. And many, many marriages are this pretense, right? Okay, now the, the, the open relationship, on the other hand, has another problem. It becomes very quickly, says Buber, an I-I relationship. So who can define, based on the lecture you listened to, what is the I-I relationship look like? What, what is the problem there? Who can define the I-I relationship or give an informed guess? <laughs> or try to, yeah, try to guess what it would be, I-I relationship. <laughs> Uh, Rudolf, you're our yes. Go ahead. Arrogantly self-serving. Okay. All right. Got it. Yes. Very good. Yes. The I I is basically um, you stay as long as your heart's in it. So what really matters is not the other. It's your heart, right? So as long as you're happy, as long as you're enjoying yourself, as long as you got this, you know, loving feeling, as long as you've got the groove, right? You're gonna be there. 
But when this goes away, right? You're not staying because of the other, you're staying because you feel good. And when, when you don't feel good, you leave. So in a way, in that kind of relationship, the other has no say because all that you're listening to is you. That's the I, I. Okay, let me say it again, right? In the I, I relationship, the other does not exist. They have no say. <laughs> they might not agree with you leaving, right? But you are only listening to yourself, <laughs> right? Your feelings, how you feel, your happiness, right? Um, your needs, <laughs> right? And as you're exploring and focusing on your needs, your happiness, your feelings, you are in a way and, and neglecting totally and not even taking into consideration the feelings of the other, you are really in a relationship with yourself, says Boober, <laughs> right? You're not in a relationship with another person because the only thing listening to, the, the only person you're listening to is you, right? So that's the I, I. So does everybody get the distinction between I, I and I, it. Make sure you put your hand in the screen if you're following. Okay, Patakov, you have a question? Um, no, not really. I just wanted to make a comment. So I think that the I, I relationship, uh, according to Buber, could be summed up as <laughs> saying that in, in a relationship, uh, you take but you don't give. So that's yeah. the basic premise. Love it. Yes, that's that's yeah, uh, that's great. Thank you, Fatako. That's a really nice uh, way to put it. Right? You're taking, it's not about giving, it's about what do I what's in it for me? Is there still something in it for am I happy? That's the question you ask when you're in an I, I relationship. Am I happy? It's so funny. I have a funny story about um, my parents. Um, so my dad's best friend one day um decided to leave his wife um for another woman. And, you know, my dad was crushed, right? I mean, everybody around him was crushed. And, and my dad tells me that he was talking to a colleague of his about this friend. And, you know, and the colleague was actually asking my dad because they were friends, why, you know, what's going on? Why, why did he leave his wife? What's happening? And my dad, you know, he said, well, you know, he wasn't happy. And the guy answers, happy? Who's happy? Are you happy? Am I happy? Who's happy, <laughs> right? It's a great answer, right? in a way that when it comes to relationships, happiness cannot be the gauge that you use. Because very often, to be honest, when you're unhappy, it's you, <laughs> right? It's not, you know, the other can never really make us unhappy. It's very often how we perceive the situation or how miserable we already are on the baseline, right? So happiness is not really a good detector of whether the relationship is going well or not, because happiness 100% depends on you, your perspective, your, your way of seeing the world, your, your, you know, your balance in your own body, right? Is, 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 is contributing to your happiness. So, so, but the I, I is thinking happy. Am I happy with this person? I'm not, okay, time to move on. <laughs> Right. I'm happy. Okay, I stay. As long as I'm happy, I stop being happy. It's over, right? So that so very good, right? That's a very nice way for that to put it. And and again, that's the question. If you're thinking, am I happy? You're on the I I level, <laughs> right? If you're thinking, another question we ask ourselves, which is a more I it question. Um, what was the question? I had a therapist. She asked me this. She 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 said, um, what are you getting out of this? <laughs> What am I getting out of this? She, she, she was sensing, right, that in, in a past relationship that it, there was an imbalance, right? And she's like, what do you get? And I didn't like the question. Right? I thought the question was not, was poorly formulated, right? Because the, I had Boober, of course, in the back of my mind, where Boober is saying, you know, it's not about what's in it for you. And it's not about, am I happy? These are the wrong questions, right? When it comes to evaluating a relationship. Okay, so now we have a little better idea, right, of the crisis of, of the potential problems, right, in marriage and in a, a, a open or polyamory, polyamorous relationships. So now we can go into what Buber is proposing. Now I can do this now or we can take a break. <laughs> so would you guys like to finish early and we just plow through or would you like a break? Uh, how many of you wanna plow through? Hand in the screen. One. <laughs> okay, how many want a break? <laughs> One, two. Okay, we'll do a quick break and then we'll go into Boober's. Um, we've only done barely. Mm, kind of want to continue. Yeah, I'm going to make an executive decision. <laughs> I 
I'm going to continue. Let me continue because we're in a good flow. Okay. So now that we've seen um, this uh, issue, and if you need to go to the bathroom, just take the computer with you and turn off your camera. <laughs> I do this all the time. So just continue to listen. Okay. So what Buber now is proposing is to salvage uh, the committed relationship, right? Or the marriage. And the way he's going to do that, which I think is quite brilliant, he's going to bring some of that free spiritedness of the I.I. of the polyamory and inject it into the marriage in order to renew it. And so let's first look at the sentence he gives us, right, which is uh, the key here. And in fact, a few years ago, I asked one of my students to make a little um, a magnet for my fridge with that sentence. She made it for the whole class because it's, it's a great thing to remember. And I want you all at this point to write it down Keep it somewhere safe in your wallet so that in 10 years within your marriage, I want you to pull it out of your wallet because this is the key. This is going to be a lifesaver. So how many of you are ready for that sentence? Hand in the screen. I need more cameras. Um, okay, good, thanks. All right, uh, so here it is, page 95. I'm going to read the third line on page 95. Marriage can never be renewed except Right? So he's saying, in general, it cannot be renewed, except, right? In other words, it might feel completely hopeless. You might have come to a point where you're both, you know, it's a dead end, right? And most of the time it's true. You cannot renew a marriage which has reached a dead end, where the feelings are dead, where the betrayal is too deep, right? And yet he says, except, right? So even the worst marriage, even the worst situation, there's an except, right? Except that which is always the source of all true marriage, and this is the key, that two human beings reveal the you to one another. In other words, very often the marriage has gone south. Why? Because the IU relationship, which we're going to now study in depth, right? This IU relationship has been lost and has degenerated into an I-it or an I-I relationship. And at that moment, when you start to feel that either your partner's you is missing or your you is missing, this is when the marriage begins to uh, go, go downhill. So this is the key. If we can master the IU relationship and then remember to practice it, both for the other and for ourselves, we have a key to salvage any relationship that's gone terribly wrong. Because the, the chances are it's gone wrong because the IU at one point has been dissolved, right? So let's go into that. There's a passage which goes very deep into this, and now we're going to study it at length. So this is on page 55. So turn with me to 55. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on the IU relationship, applying it directly to our relationships so we can see what it looks like to practice the IU, to reveal the IU towards our partners. Okay, everybody on page 55 with me, the top of page 55, wave at me. Top of page 55, yes. Okay, thank God Fatakov is there waving at me. He's the only one talking to me today. <laughs> I don't know where the rest of you are. Okay, all right, let's go there. Okay, so for this, I'm going to uh, hire your help, right? This is a little bit like Rumi. This is poetic writing. This is not, you know, when you read it, it makes no sense if you're trying to take it literally. This is poetic writing. And so we need, of course, remember that poetry is there not to inform, but to awaken. Remember, that's the definition of poetry I gave you guys when we did Rumi. So I want to know what some of these uh, in, uh, sentences evoke in you. What is the meaning you think it has, right? So let's begin with the first one, top of page 55. Whoever says you does not have something for his object. That's the first definition of the IU. There's about four or five that I'm going to go through. So let's, so now I'm going to really, uh, I'm, I'm clearing the floor for participation. I need to hear you guys uh, on this. I'm not going to do this by myself. <laughs> I can't. The, this, is, uh, this is poetry, right? So it's okay. So let me hear a few of you on what does it mean that when you're treating someone like a you, it means that you don't have something or that they are not something or that they're not an object. So this is familiar territory. We talked about it with Kant. I mentioned it briefly now. I just want to review. What does it mean? You don't have something for an object when you are in an IU relationship.
if you know the answer, speak up so we don't sit here. <laughs> Even if it's always the same person. <clears throat> I don't mind. <clears throat> okay, Garcia, go ahead. So from what I understand, what you said, I got it. I interpret that poem as like a, uh, in a relationship with an I, you, you are telling the person, since it's like you're looking at it like yourself, you're telling the person some information that you need, but you never interpret it to yourself. Explain that a little bit, it's intriguing. Go ahead. Like, you know, this is the thing, like, I guess for me too, I give advice to my friends that I never, I, I never understood. So I give advice, like good advice to them, but I never take the advice. So it's like you're telling someone something that's of importance, but you never take it in. And how does that connect to having, so to treating someone like an object? Can you make the connection? So I was thinking like, since it's like an object, right? This is the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it's an object, you treat it like an object. I guess in a way, you, see, he's the object, but like, It's, 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 yeah, I got it. I'm stuck. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who can unstuck Garcia? Who can help? What does it mean to treat someone like an object? You have, how does, what does it mean to treat them like a something? What does it mean to treat people like, oh, you're a thing. You're a thing, a something for me. You're an object for me. What does it mean to do that? We've talked about this already. This should be easy. What's it going to be like when we get in the other stuff? <laughs> Don't worry. <clears throat> Uh, okay, Souvenel says in the chat, somebody disposable. Okay, so exactly, right? This is what we saw already, right? It's Kant, right? He's alluding, remember, he's familiar with Kant. He has read Kant, right? So remember, Kant is talking about an object that's something we use and discard, right? So the first thing we have to curb in a relationship, and this can be whether you're dating only in the dating field, right, or in a committed relationship, are you using that person for your own benefit? Is it only about your needs, right? Like Fatakov was saying, are you only taking and not giving, <laughs> right? Or are you also giving and is it also about the other person's needs, right? So when you have an object, you're only thinking about what that person is doing, how they are fulfilling you, right? You're not thinking about what you could do to fulfill them, right? So at that moment, you are in an I-it uh, relationship. Right? And, and many marriages, it's like that, right? The, the husband or the wife thinks that the partner is there to do this, do that, do this for them, <laughs> right? To fulfill certain needs, right? And what Buber is saying is that at that moment, you are drifting. And when you're only thinking of your partner as the one fulfilling your needs without ever it crossing your mind that you also are there to fulfill theirs, right? you are slowly drifting towards an I-8 relationship. And that's the using, right? And then the discarding is this attitude that when it doesn't serve you anymore, it's time to discard the person, right? It's time to leave them, find something better, right? So this attitude of, I'm only thinking of my needs and my happiness, and I'm ready to, to, you know, to dump you <laughs> if this is not gonna happen, you are, on the, you are sinking into the I it level and you're losing the IU. So anytime, by the way, you are in a committed relationship and you want to recover the IU, there are two things that have to shift, right? And again, what's powerful about this shift, let me, let me emphasize this because this is very important. Many relationships, the feelings die. I hope you're listening. The feelings die and we don't know why, right? How many of you have experienced this? You were in a relationship and the feelings died and you still don't know what happened. Anybody can relate. Put your hand in the screen. No, nobody ever was in a relationship. Like, okay, one brave soul. Okay, that's it. The rest of you, uh, <laughs> it's going great. <laughs> okay, all right. So certainly, right? If you haven't been yet, you will be right, in a relationship, because all relationships get to that point, right, where the feelings are not the same anymore, right, so now you're thinking, what, what is happening, what, what went wrong, well, the first question you ask is, have I lost the IU relationship, have, has the other person become all about my needs, right, has it all become about my needs, and am I ready to split up with them if I'm not seeing those needs fulfilled, so part of recovering the IU is committing to the person no matter what, 
this is this is the risk right because as long as you're thinking i can discard you you're in the i it and your relationship is not going to be renewed the moment you say i'm in it no matter what we're going to work on this we're going to fix this we're going to try to go through this together i know there's problems i know we're dealing with stuff i know the feelings are dead but i'm not leaving you that moment is profoundly redemptive if when you have a crisis you make it conditional let's work it out and if it doesn't work out let's split up you're not going to renew it it's the courage and the risk and the audacity to say we have a problem but i'm not going to leave you and we're going to work it out just saying that is poof, lifting your relationship back to the iu and creating the possibilities for renewal as long as you're not in it 100%, as long as you're not invested 100% in the relationship, you're always on the I it level. And your relationship will never experience renewal. I hope you got that. I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> All right. As long as you're not in it 100%, as long as there's always something that could change your mind, as long as the door is always open for you to exit, you will always remain on the I it level and you will never experience the profound renewal that the uh, genuine IU relationship can bring. I hope you got that. Okay, Rudolf, go ahead. <laughs> this is a philosophy class. I would want to say that you can actually use this prescription for many, many other situations in life. I have found that <laughs> perseverance of that kind is actually the secret to success <laughs> in your profession, in your dealings with other people, in business, uh, in your own health. Whatever disappointment you're facing, if you're approaching it with a mindset <clears throat> similar to what you just defined, I think it's a good recipe to uh, to be successful. Excellent. Me and Rudolf are co-teaching the class, in fact, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> right? So uh, I love it. No, this is true. I have found this to be true in my career, for example, right? The, the, the temptation to give up when things get tough and just plowing through stupidly right is the only path to success when it comes to your career when it comes to friendships when it comes to kids right how many times we we want to just kick them out <laughs> just go right we don't want to stick it out and and we lose the possibility of renewal right so yes absolutely i agree with rudolph that this 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 practice of no exit Right. This is the practice of I have no exit here. I cannot turn back. There is no way out. Now what? Right. That is actually what will profoundly reorder your relationship into an IU. It will it will elevate it back into an IU. And then the possibilities of renewal are, are very, very uh, are possible. Right. OK, so that's that's excellent. Um, very good. Now, let's go to the next uh, clause, which is a little further in the same paragraph on page 55. And it's very enigmatic. And I want to focus on it a little bit. It says this, the you has no borders. So the you, so meaning you are looking at the other person and you're not creating borders around them. OK, it's so a poetry. OK, so what does it mean? To, to keep yourself to, to, to abstain from creating borders around your beloved. And how do we often do that? And what would it mean to take them down? Okay, so this is, this is actually a very interesting idea, very profound idea, which we'll talk about in Kierkegaard, which I'm mad now that I didn't do Kierkegaard first, because uh, it, it really applies. Um, but yeah, let's, let's see how we can get into that. Um, so I'm all ears. What does it mean to put a border on someone in a bad way? Or maybe you could put it like this. What does it mean to put a limit on someone? Or what does it mean to uh, fence someone in, <laughs> right? The famous song in the American West, right? Uh, Don't fence me in, right? It's a very famous um, country song, I think. Um, or no, even earlier, <laughs> right? So what does it mean when we start to fence our beloved in or to put limitations on our beloved? And how does this happen very often in marriage, actually? All right, I'm all ears. <clears throat> Y'all need to wake up. I'm going to go and do a massive uh, camera check. OK. Suleymanov, Garcia, Pierre. Nobo, are you there? Tan, or I see you, Tan. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> um, oh, yes. 
yeah, I see some light, so I know you're there. <laughs> noble is all dark, but noble is sick, so maybe that's why. Okay, all right, guys, I'm listening. What does it mean? Oh, noble, you're there. Yes. <laughs> okay, what does it mean? You can put it in the chat too, by the way. If you're if you don't feel like talking, I get it, <laughs> right? You can put some of these answers in the chat. What does it mean when you start to put a border around someone? What does it mean when you start to put a limitation on someone? So feel free to use the chat if you're uh, not in the mood of talking. Okay, Donaldson, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I think I like think of like boundaries right, right away. And like, you know, I've always been kind of like taught that setting boundaries is a good thing. But at the same time, I think, you know, if you set too many boundaries with someone, you're kind of like manipulating and controlling them a little bit. Oh, I like that. Can you give us an example? Um, I feel like something common is like um, that's interesting. I like that. You know, you're, you're you're in a relationship and you're dealing with someone, and uh, you know they're they want to go out and do something else tonight. And like you're like, no, I don't want you to do that. And I think <laughs> that's ridiculous, and you can't do that to someone that's like controlling them. But I think okay. that is like a common thing that people go through. Yes, excellent. But anytime you're trying to control that person and make them into your own image of who they should be, <laughs> boundary, border, right? You are limiting them. You want them to fit your ideal, right? By the way, this is so interesting, right? I want to talk a little bit about that, right? We always want our beloved to fit into our vision of who the beloved would be, right? We always want them to fit into the ideal man or the ideal woman or the ideal partnership. And in doing so, sadly, we destroy our relationship, right? We were meant to be partnered with imperfection, imperfection, right? We need to remember this. We were never meant to be partnered with perfect people. We were always meant to be partnered with imperfect people because that is where the labor of love can really travail, can really take place, right? So the person is always going to be a little bit out of tune with the ideal you have, right? And anytime you want to fix them into what you think they should be, you are putting a border, you are destroying the IU, and you're killing the love. Right. The, and, and this is interesting because I love the way you connected it to boundaries, because um, I have I have friends like this who have very strict boundaries, but then their boundaries become terrible straitjackets <laughs> for the persons they're with. Right. They're so intent on protecting themselves that they create a prison for their beloved. Right. And so very important to at least if you have boundaries that it be about you and not about controlling the other person so yes there are multiple ways we control each other we want to control the career moves our partners make like what do you mean you're going to study what we don't or what do you mean you want to change your career right or what do you mean you want to work now <laughs> right or what what are you wearing are you wearing that <laughs> or or why are you eating that you're fat enough as it is right and so forth there are multiple ways right that we try to control our partners their diet their clothes their career um their thoughts <laughs> right as soon as we do that sadly the iu begins to degenerate and the relationship begins to die right so that's number one way that we create a border what's another way i think there was garcia that had his hand up for a bit garcia you want to say what you got to say i was going to agree with jesse in regards to um boundaries and stuff like that i think that truly is one of the biggest borders within relationships I was kind of thinking of more of a mindset kind of border when you do the I and you, you know, because sometimes I guess in a way, as you speak to some people, manipulation can occur and it creates like a sort of border sense around them. Many what? Sorry? Many? Oh, sorry. Uh, one second. In like a relationship sense, uh, when, you, when communication occurs and sometimes there's also manipulation, I believe. Mm. it kind of creates like a border sense to like their own emotions like sometimes like oh like should i do this but i'm too scared of like i'm too scared if i'm gonna hurt his feelings and that's create, kind of creates like a border thing like it may be like an overthinking sort of way oh i see what you mean it's so a be careful here you're talking about i'm putting a border around myself what he's talking about is putting a border around the other person <laughs> right so oh, uh, okay. can you apply what you said to uh to the metaphor that he's giving um, what is there a way you can translate what you just said? Do you need more time? To, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to think right now because, like, I'm like 
in my head, how like I'm thinking about borders, like what Jesse was, the, so she was saying about like how you know boundaries and stuff like that. Yeah. But I want you. I wanted to think kind of more in depth with it. So I was like. You, oh, no. I guess you know, like people can create like a mindset like that. Yes, I think I, I see what you're saying. Some of us, we, uh, for example, when you give the silent treatment, when you don't express your emotions, in a way, the other person feels trapped, right? So in that sense, you're trapping mm -hmm. them, right? In in this relationship yeah. where there's no communication. So yeah, I think we could say that, right? So so another way then to explain it, okay? So you guys can write this down, right? Another way uh, apart from, you know, controlling them, you can also control them. Uh, by with withholding right this is another form of control that garcia is saying i can give the silent treatment withhold my emotions withhold my love still a way to manipulate and to control the other person right so anytime you see yourself withholding your love or withholding sex or withholding this or withholding that because you want that right you are in the, again in an i it you are controlling manipulating um very nice uh garcia okay rudolph tell us <clears throat> at least uh getting back to the text um in the beginning he says that um the interplay between people is such that you should not treat this person as a thing so when you put a border around a person or limit them in their expression you're not allowing them to uh communicate with you you are not receiving any communication and that kind of reaches back to Rumi where he talks about the mirror and, and being open to not negatively reflect anything but being open and asking for help and you are uh, according to Kant then being very disrespectful by not following your duty of being rational and logical you're only looking at something that you want and not giving. You're only wanting to receive again. You're limiting the other individual in, in his or her ability to express themselves. Okay, good. Yes, uh, absolutely. When we try to, when we downplay somebody's emotions or someone's experience, right? When we say, why are you crying again, right? Or why you always get so mad, right? So anytime we start to... Um, to uh, despise each other's way of expressing emotion, right? Sometimes we despise someone for being, you know, too, too getting too angry, being too fiery, or we, we despise them because they're weepy, always crying, or we despise them, right? And you're locking them up. They're not going to share, right? So anytime we, um, what's the word, demean or despise somebody's way of speaking or talking or expressing emotion right again we are locking them up so again this is a, the attitude of control now there's another way to see the no borders and this is something we'll touch upon with kierkegaard when when we do him on thursday but this is the idea of um having a set uh, this is a link to what you were saying rudolph with forgiveness when someone has committed a wrong with regards to us very often we are tempted to make them that wrong. In other words, they lie once or they cheat once or they, you know, uh, are violent once. And then now we have a category for them. You're a liar, you're a cheater, you're an abuser, you're a narcissist, right? We have these categories that somebody has a certain behavior that we don't like and boom, we lock him into this category. By the way, this is very useful for those of you studying psychology. Because psychology is full of these categorizations, right? This is the, um, over here, psychotic, narcissist, right? This is the bipolar, this is the borderline personality disorder. So we immediately attach a label to that person out of which they cannot come. One of the ways to take away the border is to acknowledge that a human being can always change. And this is something that very often we are not ready to accept, right? So let me say that again, right? To take away the border is to acknowledge that human beings are more than their label. They're more than their condition. They're more than their uh, psychological profile, right? Anytime you say of someone, oh, they're a narcissist, you have locked them into a label and you have not given them room to prove themselves otherwise, right? And it's very tempting, especially nowadays to just label people and then kind of, you know, uh, 
really stop hoping that anything better will come out of them, right? And we'll talk very much, much more in depth about this with Kierkegaard with the concept of hope. But in general, right, we have a way of locking someone in their dysfunction. And to take away the border would be to admit, yes, that person behaves like this, but it doesn't mean that they're stuck there forever. There's always room, possibility for change, for evolution, for growth. Right. And that's one of the ways we put a border is when we determine that's it. They're always going to be like that. They're never going to change. They're a narcissist. Right. They have right. They're a cheater. And boom, we have locked them in a category and they are stuck there. It's a border. Right. To take away that border and leave room for possible growth and transformation on the part of our beloveds is a way to reclaim the IU relationship. Right. Okay, any last comments on the border? Anybody want to add last thing on the border? Okay, let's go to the next one. Whoever says you does not have something, he has nothing. Oh, what does it mean? You have your beloved and now you gotta act like you have nothing. <laughs> what does that mean? To have nothing or to act in the relationship as though you had nothing. What's he trying to say here? And again, in the chat, if you have ideas. <clears throat> so what does it mean to have nothing? I thought that I would have a boyfriend or I would have a girlfriend or I would have a husband or I would have a wife. And now Boober is saying no you need to walk around have, as a have not. <laughs> Even you, you are in a relationship, you cannot walk around like you have a spouse or you have a girlfriend or boyfriend. What does it mean to, to act, to, to be in a relationship without having? <laughs> okay, Rudolph in the chat, right? A person is not a possession. Exactly, right? Very often, by the way, we fall in love just to have. <laughs> We fall in love just to have that boyfriend or that girlfriend or that wife or that husband. So we don't feel like a destitute, <laughs> right? There is a way that society judges us when we are single as though we were, you know, in dire poverty, <laughs> right? And so we wanna have even the marriage vows, right? To have and to hold many problems with the marriage vows, right? So many people are reformulating, right? So the idea that the, the beloved is never something that you can own. You can never have that person, right? You have to acknowledge that they're never really yours. This is very hard, right? Because when we're in love or when we're in a relationship, we think they're mine. <laughs> Even a whole Valentine's Day has cards, be mine. <laughs> be my valentine mine right and here Buber is saying as as soon as you start to see your beloved as your beloved you're entering the district of the i it right we have to be always ready to release our beloved they are not ours to create or to fashion or to form or to possess right they are their own person <laughs> with their own dreams and their own plans and their own journey sometimes that they have to take sometimes away from us, right? We never have them. We never own them. They are never, it's never going to be your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend. These are wrong formulations, right? So this is a very, very uh, difficult. We saw this in the Song of Songs, right? When the woman was, had to shift, the man would not let her own him. Right, he was. He really destroyed that that um, uh, that uh, what do you call it? Um, this delusion she had, right, that she could own him, and so she had to switch from "my beloved is mine" to "I am my beloved's." Right, so the the ability to switch from possessiveness to release to surrender is what Buber is talking about here. Okay, let's skip a couple more uh, page. There's a few more pages with the IU, and then we'll we'll conclude. Go to page sixty two. I like this one very much, actually. Um, the first line, page 62, who is with me? The you encounters me by grace. Let me see if you're there. Wave at me if you're there. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. 
Snowy came back. I'm happy. <laughs> okay, good. All right. The UN counters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. So this should sound a little bit like Rumi, right? We talked about that. Can anyone tell me what do you think that means? To see your partner as encountering you by grace. How does that shift the dynamic? How can you salvage your marriage by seeing them as a grace? It's interesting. What does it mean, a grace? Let's go into that. What does it mean to receive a grace? Right? Uh, Donaldson, go ahead. Uh, I, I think it has to do with um, like how you view the person. You know, um, I think when you take someone for granted, it's easy to kind of go into the kind of I, it kind of way of thinking. And um, when I read this quote and thinking about the grace, like you should be, you should feel like you're lucky to be with them and that they choose to be with you, You're lucky. Very good, you got it, right? We we tend to think our partner always gonna stay, you know, this, there are, you know, hours now, <laughs> right? To remember all, every day what a gift that person is, right? What a gift the universe gave you, what a gift God gave you, what a gift they gave you, right? In their own person, to, to, to remember the giftedness of love, that we never really deserved it, right? Any one of us who ends up in a, in, a, in a thriving relationship, it's completely undeserved. <laughs> you will realize that, right? The ability to realize like, I didn't deserve you. And yet here you are. This mindset will salvage your relationship, right? It's when you lose this idea that I don't, I never deserved you. It was such a gift that you came into my life. This forgetting of the giftedness of the other you're now sinking into the I it where it's just an old object over here in a corner, right? Um, excellent. So yes, um, another way to see this, so let me add to what Donaldson said, um, is that the you in a relationship that we've lost, that we very quickly lose, right? The you very often, it's, you can't make it come back, right? You can't make the relationship be, renewed this is uh, i know that there's many sex therapists and you know love therapists that will tell you here are the steps to renew your relationship but actually if you've been through the death of a relationship nothing that you're doing it's making it worse actually the more you try to fix it the more the partner is trying to get away from you <laughs> right and so we have to realize sometimes it's just about just become a you let them be a you and see what happens. Allow the renewal to take place by itself. There is a grace that comes when you just surrender, right? Sometimes you're so busy trying to fix the relationship that you, you are in a way forgetting that love is always a grace. Renewal is always a grace. And at one point you will feel it and you will feel the need to just surrender and give up and just be like, I've done everything I can. I am here, I am willing, but I can't make this happen. At that moment, midnight, says Rumi, right? Midnight, when you stop trying, when you can't do it, when you've reached the darkest hour, at that moment, the beloved can come back, right? So this is another thing we can learn is that, yes, in this class, we learn how to, you know, we learn the labor of love, we learn, uh, you know, we, I'm giving you tools to forge or to uh, create lasting relationship, but there's still an element of grace. When things have gone south, when your relationship has died, sometimes after you've done everything, you have to surrender. You have to just sit and wait <laughs> for the grace to happen, right? There is always going to be that part of grace that has to kick in once you've done everything and you realize it's not enough, at that moment you stop. And you just, you stop all thrivings, all strivings, right? And then grace can, can appear, right? So there's an element of grace in the renewal that we need to be aware of, right? Um, excellent. And then finally, the last quote is on page, uh, what is it, uh, 62 also. I love that one. This is the last line. Next to last line on 62, I require a you. Let's see if you're there. Wave at me if you're there. I require a you. Yes, I need, okay, a couple of waves, thank you. All right, so he says this, it's very interesting. 
I require a you to become. Becoming I, I say you. So it sounds like a riddle, okay? What does he say? What does it mean that I require a you to become? And what does it mean that becoming I, I say you? Okay, who can solve the riddle? This is the, the last, um, last thought of Buber. What does it mean that I need a you to become? And what does it mean that as I'm becoming an I, I'm able to say you? It's two different thoughts, okay? Sounds like the same thought, but it's different. I need a you to become an I, and then as I'm becoming an I, I can say you. Okay, let's see if we have an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rudolph. I can view this becoming as uh, the process of enlightenment, of reaching out and being able to respect the individual opposite. Um, and in, I, it is required by me because without this process of being able to view the other person as an equal or even more than I am, I really is meaningless. If it's only I for me, myself, then uh, without the you, without the reflection, without the communication, there is no sense in being. And becoming I, I say you. So the moment when I realize that I have actually the willingness to open myself up for this interchange, then there is the interplay between I and you, and I then become I. Okay, great, nicely put. Okay, good, yes, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Let me summarize, right, what he said and add a little more, right? In order to become fully ourselves, we cannot become fully ourselves as long as we're engaging in I, 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 it relationship. Buber is saying the condition of our own blossoming as a human being is the, is, it, it rests on the ability to say you, on the ability to engage in I, you relationships. In other words, as long as you're stuck on the I, it and I, I level, you will never reach the full potential of who you are as a human being, right? Um, Adulthood in relationships, maturity in relationships has to do with leaving behind the I, it, and the I, I, and maturing into a, an individual capable of saying you, right? So he's saying our own becoming is dependent on the quality of our relationships. Let me say that again, right? He's saying this, our own becoming as a person is dependent on the quality of our relationships. This is completely different than what we are taught. We are taught to become, we have to study, make money, have a house, and then we're it, right? We're there. No, Buber is saying you're nothing. <laughs> you're nothing in that big house by yourself. You're nothing until you've learned to develop deep, authentic relationships with other human beings, right? Until you've raised yourself to the level of the IU, you are still a stunted version of yourself. So he's not saying, you know, don't do I, it, don't do I, I, he's saying, go for it. But if you do, you will never be the true, fully blossomed self you would become in the, in, in the challenge of the IU relationship because the IU relationship you're seeing is not easy to do that, right? To curb your desire to control, to not, to hope in someone even though they're not doing good, to, to, to take away the borders and so forth, right? So, so this, this challenge, is what will make us into our full version of ourselves. And then the opposite, also true, which we saw in the Song of Songs. As I become an I, now I am ready to say you. Very often when people treat us badly in relationships, right? When they use us and discard us, right? Or when they're only thinking of their own feelings, this is not really saying anything about you. I hope you're listening. If you're somebody who's been used, who's been discarded in a relationship and now you're feeling worthless, no. It says more about them than about you. Anyone who uses, discards is still an unevolved I, right? Once you've reached your full potential as an I, this is when you can truly love, right? This is why, remember, we talked about this, I think, with um, Aristophanes, right? You, you want to be 
reach the highest version of yourself before you can attract your true soulmate, right? You want to be an I. Uh, be, you want to be the full version of yourself. You want to be happy with yourself. You want to be happy by yourself. And this is the, by the way, this is the sign you've reached the fullness of your I. Are you happy by yourself? That's the question you should ask yourself. If you're not happy by yourself, you're not there yet, <laughs> right? Basically, Boober is saying, you can't be in a real relationship until you first learn to be happy by yourself, until you have become an I, happy by yourself. You can't say you. You're always going to be saying it and I, right? So that's also, we saw that with the Song of Songs, right? When she released the possessiveness, when she said, I am my beloved, right? When she shifted to herself, to, to um, powerful stance of not being needy and obsessive, but being happy with herself is when right she was able to attract the beloved back right so so same idea so very profound idea right very profound thoughts are hidden in these two sentences right so you can see now right i i hopefully have given you the key to renew your marriage and by the way this i you thing applies to us if you so it's always this right the first symptom is there's no more feeling the feelings have died you feel like the love is gone. First question you ask before you go see the sex therapist and ask or go, you go to the sex shop and buy some you know, funny sex toys to spice things up. Before you do any of that, ask yourself, have we lost along the way the I you? Have I lost a sense of my partner as a you? And also sometimes more importantly, have I lost a sense of me as a you? Have I lost my you, <laughs> right? Have I allowed my partner to control me, to change me, to, to shift me and made me become something I'm not? Have I allowed my partner to kill my dreams? Have I allowed them to kill my aspirations? Am I stuck here in a mold of their own creation, right? Ask yourself these questions. Have I lost my you? Because very often it's you who's lost your you. And this is why the love has died. And so revealing the you, reclaiming your identity, reclaiming your dreams, your aspirations, reclaiming who you are and not who they think you should be, <laughs> right? And then you can ask yourself after that, the other question, have I made my partner into an it, right? Have I lost respect for who they are specifically? Am I trying to change them all the time? Am I trying to control them? Have I lost hope in who they can become, right? Am I just despairing of them and putting them in a small, narrow space where they're stuck in their, you know, past transgressions, right? And so as you ask yourself these questions, right, you begin to make the changes. There's still a moment where you have to wait for grace. It's not going to happen immediately. As you begin to shift and reclaim your you and respect the you of the other, there's still a lapse. You're not going to be the one rejuvenating the relationship. You're just creating the right conditions for grace to transform the relationship, right? There's always grace at the end. We cannot fix these things. You cannot fix your relationship, but you can create the right conditions for the relationship to be reborn. But that rebirth is never in our hands. This is something we have to hope for, wait for, be patient for, right? Um, but definitely, oh, and one last thing, right? The last criteria that you're in IU relationship, no exit, no exit, <laughs> right? That's, are you always thinking of exiting? Or is your partner always thinking of exiting? Take that out of the equation. Now you can rebuild, right? Okay, any last questions on Boober or issues or things you're struggling with that you want clarification on with regards to the renewal of a relationship? This is the moment. We have a lot of time <laughs> uh, if you want. Um, also, you can stay after, right? Always in this class, you can stay after and, and come with a real life uh, examples. Okay, that's it. Everybody's happy. <laughs> you're all ready now to um, renew your a future 10 year relationship, hopefully. Okay, so um, good, we'll conclude. So whoever wants to stay after you can stay and um, the rest of you can go. So next, next th I mean, this coming Thursday, right? Just give me whatever work connected to Buber or Kierkegaard, right? Just bring me everything from Buber and Kierkegaard and I'll count it. And so we will be doing Kierkegaard <laughs> next um, on Thursday. 
All right, guys, I will see you. Uh, whoever needs to stay can stay. Whoever needs to go can go. And I will stop the recording.